Sean Green was one of the more underrated players during the late 90s and early 2000s. He was a consistent and durable outfielder who played for some underperforming teams during the steroid era and retired rather early at just 34 years old. He's one of those guys who, when you think of early 2000s baseball, his name doesn't immediately come to mind, but if and when he's brought up in a conversation, you'll be like, oh yeah, Sean Green? That dude was a beast. He was drafted by and broke into the league with the Toronto Blue Jays and then was traded to the Dodgers after eight years with the organization after the 1999 season. He was traded from Toronto after that 99 season, a year in which he led the American League in doubles, total bases, extra base hits, was an all-star, won a gold glove and a silver slugger, and finished ninth in the MVP voting. He looked poised to break out, but unfortunately the Blue Jays wouldn't reap any of those benefits. They shipped him off to LA shortly after the 99 season ended, and Green would flourish with the Dodgers. He'd break out in 2001, hitting a career-high 49 homers and driving in 125 runners, while posting a 970 OPS and a 154 OPS plus and a sixth place finish in a very crowded and juicy NL MVP race. Green looked to duplicate his success from 2001 into 2002, but he quickly hit a roadblock and got off to a sluggish start. He had thought that he needed to replicate his incredible season from a year before and was putting way too much pressure on himself to produce. He was hitting around 230 in mid-May of that year and was still looking for that spark to really get his season going. The Dodgers traveled to Milwaukee to take on the Brewers in a three-game set at Miller Park beginning on May 21st. He'd start to get things going in the first two games of the series, picking up a pair of home runs and a triple, but no one was prepared for the offensive onslaught Green was about to unleash in the series finale. When the Dodgers wrapped up their 16-3 victory on May 23rd of 2002, Sean Green had either tied or broken nearly a half dozen Major League Baseball records as he put together the greatest single offensive game in baseball history. Green was struggling when the Dodgers traveled to Milwaukee to take on the Brewers. He came in hitting just 231 with three homers and 25 RBI, an OPS of just 685, just a year removed from being a serious MVP contender. It had looked like his breakout season might have just been a fluke but this Milwaukee series would be the turning point for Green. The Dodgers and Brewers would split the first two games of the series, with Green belting a pair of dingers and knocking his first, and eventual only, triple of the 2002 season. Coming into the series finale on May 23rd, it had looked like Green was getting back on the right track, but had a tough matchup ahead of him. Glendon Rush was on the bump for the Brewers, somebody Green was all too familiar with. The two had faced off 12 times prior, with Rush holding Green to just a pair of doubles over those 12 at-bats. Hitting out of the three-hole that day, Green came up in the top of the first inning with a man on second base and hooked a curveball down the first baseline in the corner for a double, scoring the run and giving the Dodgers an early 1-0 lead. Rush and Green would face off again on the top of the second inning with two outs and two runners on. Rush would try to sneak a heater inside on Green, but Green turned on it and launched it into the right field bullpen. The Dodgers are now leading 6-0 in the top of the second inning, with Green already having a homer, a double, and four RBIs under his belt in just two at-bats. Brian Mallett took over the pitching duties for the Brewers in the top of the fourth inning and was tasked with dealing with the leadoff hitter in green. On the third pitch of that at-bat, green crushed a solo shot onto the concourse in deep right center field for his third extra base hit of the game and second consecutive long ball. Now this was only the fourth inning and Green was already having a day. Two dingers and a double would have been a good series for Green up until this point and now he'd done that in just three at-bats. Mallet and Green would face off again just an inning later, again with nobody on base. Green had pulled everything up until this point and Mallet tried to force him to either go the other way or hopefully induce a rollover to retire him for the first time all game. A fastball on the outside part of the plate quickly turned into another solo shot for Green, his third home run of the game and fourth extra base hit in a row. Now, I just want to point out how impressive this home run from Green is. Opposite field home runs are tough enough to hit and normally don't clear the wall by much, but to go oppo taco and put a ball in the bleachers at Miller Park is some crazy raw power. Right-handed hitters struggle to hit balls into the left field bleachers and that's their pull side. So for a lefty to do it is even more remarkable. It'd be a couple more innings before Green would come up to the plate, but when he did on the top of the eighth inning, he had a real shot at making some history. At that point in time, there'd only been 13 players to hit four home runs in a game, and Green was on the cusp of becoming the 14th to ever do so. All he needed was just another ball over the wall, and he could join that exclusive club. But Jose Cabrera would keep him inside the ballpark, as Green would line a single right up the middle. Entering the top of the ninth inning, Green was slated to come up fifth and would need 
need some help from his teammates in order to get another shot at that fourth home run. Chad Kruder would lead off with a double to give the inning a promising start, but then pitcher Jeff Williams would go down on strikes, and Jeff Rebel had fouled out to put the pressure on a young Adrian Beltre. Yup, that Adrian Beltre. Future Hall of Famer Adrian Beltre. Hates when people touch his head Adrian Beltre. That guy. He'd take a strike before bopping a homer over the left center field wall to give Green an opportunity at history. Now, the four homer game wouldn't be the only major league record that Green was chasing entering that at bat in the ninth inning. With a hit, Green could tie the major league record of hits in a nine inning game with six, something which had been done a total of 47 times prior in the live ball era. Another extra base hit would net Green his fifth of the game, which would tie a major league record and make him only the fifth player ever to record five extra base hits in a game. If that extra base hit was a triple, then he would tie Joe Adcock's major league record of 18 total bases in a game, and another home run would give him the record at 19 total bases. Green had scored a run in all five of his previous plate appearances, and if he crossed home plate for a sixth time, it would tie another single game major league record, an event that was as rare as the four homer game and had only been accomplished 14 times prior. It was probably unbeknownst to Green at the time, but there was a lot of history riding on his shoulders. If he hits a home run, then he's got arguably the greatest single game performance of all time under his belt. If he makes an out, then it's just another really good game for a really good player that eventually gets forgotten about. When the 1-1 pitch came in from Cabrera, Green nearly hit the ball out of the damn stadium and began his trot towards history. There's a drive to right center field. He's done it. Four home runs for Sean Green to tie the major league record. So Green had done it. He tied the major league records for home runs in a game with four, extra base hits in a game with five, hits in a nine inning game with six, and runs in a game with six. That last home run gave him a total of 19 bases, establishing a new major league record for total bases in a single game. Now these stats would be a pretty good week for some players, but he accomplished all of this in just a single game. So the question has to be asked, how does this performance rank among the all-time great single game performances in baseball history. Now everyone knows about game score for pitchers and that's been around for a while and it's very helpful in telling us just how dominant a pitching performance truly was. Kerry Wood in his 20 strikeout game from 1998 is often regarded as the best game ever pitched and it also has the highest game score of all time at 105. ESPN has developed a rating system for batters similar to the pitching game score to better compare some single game batting performances against one another. It encourages and rewards offense production and denounces negative outcomes in order to give a final score that reflects how good or bad a game was for a hitter. Each batter starts with a base score of 59, and you add or subtract based on what stats a player put up during a given game. For Green, his batting game score on May 23rd, 2002 was a staggering 97, barely ahead of Anthony Rendon for the highest total batting game score since the formula was developed in 1993, besting multiple other four homer games. Now, this historic game would turn Green's 2002 around, as he would go on to hit 304 with 37 homers and 90 RBIs, with a 10 24 OPS to end the year, picking up an all-star nod and finishing fifth in another juicy MVP voting. Green would have a couple more good years in LA before being dealt to Arizona and eventually the New York Mets before ultimately retiring at the age of 34 following the 2007 season. Sean Green's historic day in 2002 might never be duplicated. He pretty much did and achieved everything possible that a player could do in a nine inning baseball game, and the legend of that day will live on forever. This insane feat of domination proves that you never know what you're gonna see when you go to a ballpark, and you truly can witness history from anyone anytime you watch a ball game.